Okay, we are recording. So then the next question is, is do I know how to put it from the recording on the cloud to the, the server so that you guys can access it uh, in future days? That would be the next question, but Pastor, at least got this far. Okay, we're gonna begin um, with uh, the, the full morning prayer. So what are the first words of the morning prayer, the full morning prayer? In the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit. So let's, let's begin together. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, amen. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever, amen. I thank you, my heavenly Father, through Jesus Christ, your dear Son, that you have kept me this night from all harm and danger, and I pray that you would keep me this day also from sin and every evil, that all my doings and life may please you. For into your hands I commend myself, my body and soul, and all things. Let your holy angel be with me, that the evil foe may have no power over me. Amen. Amen. So, okay. Now, um, Mr. Croc is not here. Obviously, uh, a good number of, uh, of people aren't here. It's Labor Day weekend. Thank you for tuning in. They'll be able to catch up uh, on, online. So, so, are there any questions or comments that you might have? Okay, about our Lord, about what we're doing here, stuff like this, okay? Now, always remember, the most important thing to remember always is that you live before God. This is the key thing. You are before God. You are before God at all times. So the question of how do I stand before God? Do I stand before God as his, uh, as his righteous, as his holy one, so that he will welcome me? Or do I stand as one with my sins so that he will condemn me? This is the question each and every day. It's not just a question, oh, I know Jesus, so therefore he has to forgive my sins. No, I stand as a sinner in need of Jesus, and therefore rightly understanding law, rightly understanding gospel is key in your life because you need to understand that it's only because of Jesus and his righteousness being imputed to me. And now my sins are forgiven. This is very important. This is how we live. We live before God. You live, all of you online, all of you guys in the classroom today, you live in a world that, for the most part, basically shows you to ignore God, right? And to ignore your sin. And to ignore also that he is good and gracious. And therefore, you live in a world that cuts you off of God, cuts you off of salvation, cuts you also out of love and true life. Because if you live before God, then living in God's grace and God's favor, knowing his will is really true life. So living in Jesus really is true life. Okay, I have a new person here. Um, I got to take attendance, connecting to audio here. I don't have a name yet. So um, 
who do I have here online? Well, once she connects, then I'll figure it out. Okay, so very good. Okay, so anyway, how many of you know about your calendar, online calendar, what your assignments are? What's your memory work this week? What is your memory work that parents have to sign off of? No, not yet. This week, it's the books of the Old Testament. Okay? Books of the Old Testament. So what I'd like to do, I found, okay, the books of the Old Testament are a little bit uh, um, longer, right? Okay? So there's more books of the Old Testament than the New Testament. Which Testament are we more familiar with? The New Testament, life of Jesus especially, right? So therefore, it's sometimes harder for us to remember the Old Testament. Okay, now the names are a little bit foreign, right? Have you ever noticed that in the Bible, you have a lot of names that end in E-L? How many of you ever noticed that? Like Joel, Daniel, right? Okay, how many of you have you noticed that you uh, have a lot of names that that end in A-H, right? Isaiah, uh, Jeremiah, okay? So Ezekiel, but Jeremiah, right? Okay, so you have a lot of names ending in one of these two ways. That's because E-L refers to God, A-H refers to uh, Yahweh, which is God's personal name, his covenant name that he gives to us, okay? So when you're reading, memorizing the books of the Bible, for example, Samuel refers to God. So, so get, the reason I'm telling you this is that these books are, are, the names actually make sense when you understand how Hebrew works, right? That makes it a little bit easier to memorize, okay? So what I found for you, okay, is, uh, oh, hi, Ruth. Had to see uh, who that was on, um, let me just take Ruth's, uh, um, Okay, you are now recorded, Ruth. I take your attendance, okay? So thank you very much. So what I'd like to do is I'm gonna pull up a video and Mrs. Franken's gonna turn off the light so I think everyone can see a little bit better. Let's split, not quite yet, we can split the fold. So um, what I'm talking about here is how to memorize the books of the Old Testament, okay? And this is a video that I, that I, I found, um, okay? Slowly but surely, right? I think the bulb is up. Um, what's going on here? It's up there. Yeah. And here it is. We have memorized the books of the Old Testament. Okay. So, yeah. So take a look at this video. Um, hope you guys, I'm going to change the yeah. so slightly so you guys can see it, right? You can see the board. In the Old Testament? Here's a trick to help remember. How many letters are there in the word old? Three. How many letters are there in the word testament? Nine. Let's put those two together. 39, the number of books in the Old Testament. Many people don't understand how the Old Testament is arranged. They assume that it is chronological from the first book written to the last. Instead, the Old Testament is arranged in sections. And to help us with those sections, remember that there are either in groups of five books or 12 books. In fact, we have five sections, five books, 12 books, five books, five books, and 12 books, five, 12, five, five, 12, five, 12, five, five, 12. Just remember that. Say it along with them. Here's some help with the sections. The first section is called the law. These are the books of Moses who received the law in the form of the Ten Commandments. Remember, the law consists of five books. Next is a section of history, which contains 12 books. After that are five books of poetry. Then we have five major prophets and 12 minor prophets. Major prophets aren't more important than minor prophets. They just wrote more words, so their books are longer. So let's learn a sentence that will help us remember the first five books of the law. God's eternal love never dies. Say that. Each word God's of that sentence gives us the first word of the book. Let's start with a book that means beginnings. We know it starts with a G, Genesis. 
The second book starts the journey of the Jews in the wilderness. It starts with an E, and it's called Exodus. Next is Leviticus, then Numbers, and Deuteronomy. Let's repeat those a few times. Genesis, Genesis Exodus, Exodus, Leviticus, Leviticus Numbers, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy. After the law comes history. There are 12 history books. Picture a judge named Joshua sitting in a courtroom. He is passing sentence on a woman named Ruth. At one time, she was baby Ruth, but now she has grown. Joshua judges Ruth. Those are the first three books in history. Next, we have three pairs, or another six books. They are arranged in opposite alphabetical order. 1 Samuel, 2 Samuel, 1 Kings, 2 Kings, 1 Chronicles, and 2 Chronicles. Those are nine of our history books, and we are heading in the right direction. Speaking of direction, let's go east-northeast, E-N-E. -E. That points to Ezra, Nehemiah, and Esther. Ezra was taller than Nehemiah and Esther. Nehemiah. That's all the history books. Let's repeat them in order. Joshua judges Ruth, 1 Samuel, 2 Samuel, 1 Kings, 2 Kings, 1 Chronicles, 2 Chronicles, Ezra, Nehemiah, Esther. Now we have five books of poetry. Many poets write about pain. Others write about love and overcoming pain. But the joy of the Lord is our strength, according to the Bible. Now we'll memorize another sentence. Jesus provides people eternal strength. Job, Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Song of Solomon. We only have prophets left, five major prophets and 12 minor prophets. We have gone pretty far and gone really fast. Each day is a challenge, but here's our next sentence. I just love every day. Isaiah, Jeremiah, Lamentations, Ezekiel, Daniel. Here's our last section, the minor prophets, and we have 12 to go. Following I just love every day, let's focus on why we have that enjoyment. Having Jesus always offers joy. That is why we should love every day. Let's sing a song to remember the first minor prophet. We sing a form of this song, we go to a baseball game. Hosea, can you see by the dawn's early light? Hosea. Now our second song, the first Joel, the angel did say, Joel is our second one. Then Amos, Obadiah, and the big fish of the minor prophets, Jonah. Five of the 12 minor prophets are down. Let's finish with the last seven. This starts with an abbreviation for Minnesota, which is the land of lakes with lots of fish. Though Jonah didn't go there. M-N, Micah, Nahum. One thing we won't find in Minnesota, Minnesota is a zebra. My new happy zookeeper hoists zebra manure. There's our last sentence. Micah, Nahum, Habakkuk, Zephaniah, Haggai, Zechariah, Malachi. Let's go through those minor prophets again in order. Hosea, Joel. Amos, Obadiah, Jonah, Micah, Nahum, Habakkuk, Zephaniah, Haggai, Zechariah, Malachi. This is probably our hardest section. So now let's review the law. God's eternal love never dies. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. Now we have history. Remember our courtroom. Joshua judges Ruth. The judge and the defendant make a pair, so let's do our pairs. 1 Samuel, 2 Samuel, 1 Kings, 2 Kings, 1 Chronicles, 2 Chronicles. Now that defendant moves life in a new direction, east, north, east. Ezra, Nehemiah, Esther. Poetry, Jesus provides people eternal strength. Job, Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Song of Solomon, the major prophets, I just love every day. Isaiah, Jeremiah, Lamentations, Ezekiel, Daniel. 
the minor prophets. Having Jesus always offers joy. Hosea, can you see? The first, Joel, Amos, Obadiah, Jonah, the big fish in a Minnesota lake. M.N., Micah, Nahum, no zebras in Minnesota. My new happy zookeeper hoists zebra manure. Micah, Nahum, Habakkuk, Zephaniah, Haggai, Zechariah, Malachi. In our next tutorial, we will learn to memorize the books of the New Testament. If you can turn on the light, okay, and, okay, and then we're going to um, turn off that, okay. Hey, guys online, did you see the video all right? Okay, so. Wash my hands when I touch any switch. Okay, so memorize the books of the Old Testament. Now, I'm going to post this on the calendar, this video, so that you'll be able to see like these little mnemonic devices, right? Okay, so what's our first sentence? Like Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus. What was the sentence that he gave you to memorize? It starts with God's E. Eternal love, right, God's eternal love never dies. Joshua, Judges, Ruth, okay. And, the, and then the pairs were 1 Samuel, 2 Samuel, 1 Kings, 2 Kings. And then you got Ezra, the, the directions, east, northeast, Ezra, and Nehi, remember, really, really short guy, Ezra, Nehi, Maya, Nehemiah. Esther, and then and then, Job, Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Song of Solomon. Okay, and then uh, I can't remember his sentence. Hosea, Job, Amos, Obadiah, Jonah. Whenever I memorize the old, uh, oh Alex, got another one here. Whenever I memorize the the Old Testament books, I always try to do through Jonah because that's probably the one story we remember from the Minor Prophets, right? How many of you know the story of Jonah and the whale? Raise your hand. Okay, raise your hand. Okay, okay, thank you. Thank you, Faith. Okay, so, um, so I remember that story very well. So when I, Hosea, Jonah, Amos, Obadiah, Jonah, right? Okay, and then you, you uh, uh, Hosea, Joel, Amos, Obadiah, Jonah, Mike, and Nahum, Minnesota. Okay, right? Mike, and Nahum. Okay, and then Habakkuk. Zephaniah, Haggai, Zechariah, Malachi. Now, I just, when I remember those last five, it's, it's a pattern. H, Z, H, Z, M. H, Z, H, Z, M. Okay, and then he had his, uh, um, something about zookeeper, hoist, manure, or, uh, no, manure is the last thing, right? Yeah. Okay. Um, so, I can't remember. So, so, memorizing the books of the Old Testament, you take your time, you, you do little sections. Memory work is very possible, okay? Okay, but it takes time. If you try to memorize big, big blocks all at once, guess what's going to happen? You will not memorize big, big blocks. You have in your mind something called working memory. And working memory only works when you have little things to remember. I'm going to give you a series of numbers to memorize, okay? Okay? And the number is real, real simple. Okay? Just try to remember it, okay? Okay. Zero. It's the first number. Zero. Okay. And then, and then 962. Okay. Okay, so zero, nine, six, two. That's right. Two, two, zero. Okay, and then uh, one, two, three, one, two, two, zero. Okay, have me remember the whole series. Zero, nine, six, okay. Oh, no, it's, it's not two, two, zero, it's, it's, it's two, zero, two. Okay, zero, one, two, three, 
one, two, zero, two, zero. Okay, how many of you know that? Let's say it in a different order. Let's say the numbers in a different order. Zero, nine, zero, six, two, zero, two, zero. Say that number. Yeah. Zero, nine, zero, six, two, zero, two, zero. What am I talking about? Zero, nine, zero, six, two, zero, two, zero. Today, yes. One, two, three, one, two, zero, two, zero. What day is that? One, two, three, one, two, zero, two, zero. No, that's New Year's Eve, the last day of the year, right? So all I did was, was give you a series of numbers. What if I said, memorize from today, was today's date and the last day of the year? Could you guys do that? Yeah, yeah because you have a chunk. You understand 12, 31, 2020, right? That's a chunk information. You didn't have to memorize separate numbers. You just, you just know those numbers automatically. So when you memorize small chunks of information, you can put it in your memory. When you try to memorize large chunks of memory all at one time, you'll fail. So memorize these books of the Old Testament. Now, why do we have you memorizing books of the Old Testament? So that, that you can find books in your Bible more easily. Um, I, I've sometimes seen, you know, um, confirmation students, if I say a book of the Bible, they will fumble around. They don't know where books are, okay? But if you memorize in order, then you'll look at the, you know, when you're paging through, you can find books of the Bible. But more important than that is later on to actually go and read those books of the Bible, right? That's the most important thing. Why? Why is reading the Bible important? Why is reading the Bible important? It's an obvious question. Why is reading the Bible important? Why is hearing the Bible important? So that you know God's word, okay? Why is it important to know God's word? Can you know God apart from his word? Yes or no? No. Can you know what God is like apart from his word? Can you know about how you stand before God apart from his word? No. So you need to know what God says. When God speaks, you listen. And that's very, very important. When God speaks, you listen. Okay? Um, right now, okay, we're in a classroom. Okay? And I know you guys are, are at home. But if everyone was in the classroom right now, and there was a um, some sort of emergency like a, now I know we know where the exit is right here. But what if there, we were in an unfamiliar building and the fire broke out in an unfamiliar building? But then into our room came a firefighter and he said, follow me this way out. Tell me, would you listen to that firefighter? Raise your hand, yes. Okay, okay, I was, okay. If a firefighter tells me during a fire, follow me, guess what I'm going to do? I'm going to follow him. I'm going to listen to him. Well, we're in a much worse situation than that. We're in a world of sin, and God says, follow me this way out. In fact, he actually gives us this way out with his son, Jesus. So when God speaks, we listen. Okay? Now, what if I were to, let's change the situation around, and, um, and I were to tell you, um, okay, if you listen really carefully, I will tell you where um, each of you can find a stack of $100 bills equaling $10,000. Listen to me carefully, and you each get $10,000. How many of you would listen carefully for a stack of $100 bills? I would listen carefully, okay? Let's make it even, even more graphic than that is that um, I will show you where I will get where a bunch of money is so that you need no more money the rest of your life. How many of you want to know that? 
okay? Except in, what does God say? I want to tell you where righteousness is from me to give you eternal life. Do you want to hear that? Yes, especially when you're dying in a world of sin. So when God speaks, we listen. But we cannot, and this is why the Old Testament is important. Okay, brothers and sisters in Christ. I don't call you brothers and sisters. I don't want to call you boys and girls. Brothers and sisters in Christ. Many, many years ago, I wanted to study the Bible more. Many, many years ago. So I went to one of my professors and said, I want to know the New Testament better. I want to know about the life of Jesus better. I want to know what the Apostle Paul says better. And do you know what that professor told me? He said, you have to study the Old Testament. Because Jesus is the fulfillment of the Old Testament. God created the heavens and the earth in the Old Testament. God rescued his people in the Old Testament. So the Old Testament is very, very important. And these stories are very, very important. God did not write junk. So the Bible is important. So brothers and sisters, you have that video. I'm going to put it on the website so help you memorize the books of the Old Testament. And you do have to memorize them, and you do have to say them aloud in order to your parents. So work on it, but work on it slowly. You got those little sentences? How many of you saw those little sentences? What I would suggest is memorizing those sentences, okay, and then moving on from there. Okay, so it's good to see all of you today. So I hope you understand why the Old Testament is important. The Old Testament is very, very important. Again, it's less familiar. But things that are less familiar become what more familiar as we spend time in them, right? Okay. I know um, some of you are, are in school, but a lot of you this year are not in school, correct? Okay. Um, because of, of, of COVID. So you're just seeing things on, online. But normally, you'd be in school. How many of you remember, like, the first day you went to a brand new school building? Raise your hand if you remember the first day you went to a brand new school building. You'd never been in that building before. Never been in the, the school building before. Yeah, you've probably been here in preschool, right? So, okay. But do you remember the first day of preschool? No. It probably was scary, though, to be a first day of preschool, though. Okay, but if you're in a new building, you've never seen it before, it's a little bit intimidating, right? Okay, um, but after a while, you get to know the building really well. After a while, it's almost like you know everything about the building, right? Okay, and so that's, that's also like maybe moving into a new house or new neighborhood. Um, a new store opens up that you've never been in, but then after you've been in that store, say 20 times, you know it very well. So the stories of the Old Testament about David, Abraham, Noah, uh, Adam and Eve, Elijah, Elisha, Moses, Daniel, um, Esther, Hannah, um, these stories, Samuel, as you read the stories, as you remember the stories, they become more and more important. Okay. Now I know this is seventh and eighth grade confirmation. Why am I spending so much time talking about the books of the Old Testament? It's because the catechism is a summary of the Bible. Mr. Kroc talked about this. The catechism is not outside of the Bible, but it's a distillation, a summary of the main teachings of Scripture. And so I think the catechism is very, very important. Okay, so last week you talked about law and gospel, right? Did you talk about the law and gospel order of the catechism? Did you talk about that in this class? Lila, did you talk about that in this class? Do you, do you know clearly what I'm talking about? Okay, so the, the catechism is arranged in a law gospel order. Remember, the law is what God says you have to do, and there's no options. You have to do this. But ultimately, the law, even though it is a curve, even though it is a guide, ultimately, the law is a mirror, and as a mirror, it shows us our sins, right? Can the law ever, ever save? Yes or no? 
can the law ever save? Can you be saved by the law? Yes or no? No, you cannot. Okay. Okay, you cannot. The gospel does save, but the gospel is God's word to you about your Savior, Jesus Christ. And that word also brings faith in your hearts because the Holy Spirit works through the word. Jesus Christ dies for you, so it's God's work for you. Law and gospel, how God speaks to us. God speaks to us in two different ways, law and gospel. Now, Martin Luther wrote something called a small catechism. He wrote in very simple language because he had small children. I think I told you this, but I'll repeat it again. In the first, for example, first commandment is, you shall have no other gods. In your catechism, it says what? What does this mean, right? You should fear, love, and trust in God above all things, right? Now, the original German doesn't have what does this mean. Instead, the original German is what is that? That's because Martin Luther had little children. When little children don't know what a thing is, they'll point at, for example, like my thermos right here. They say, what's that? What's that? And so the catechism has first commandment. What's that? You should fear, love, and trust in God above all things. Right? Does that make sense? So this is not, the catechism is not some sort of science textbook. Rather, it's, oh, first commandment. Oh, what's that? You should fear, love, and trust in God above all things. You shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God. Oh, what's that? You should fear and love God so that you do not, what? Curse, swear, use satanic arts, lie or deceive by his name. But call upon every trouble, pray, praise, and give thanks. Oh, that's what that is. Does that make sense? And so, for example, creed also. Or what is the sacrament of the altar? What's that? Is the true body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ under the bread and wine instituted by Christ himself for us Christians to what? Eat and to drink. Right? Okay. So catechism is meant for small children. But was Martin Luther the first one ever to write a catechism? Yes or no? No. There were other catechisms before him. Okay, so. Okay, so. Before Martin Luther, there were catechisms. And they would have this arrangement. They would go and do, I'm going to abbreviate, the Apostles' Creed first. Lord's Prayer. And then they would do the Ten Commandments. I forgot it again. Okay. Okay, so this is the old way of arranging the small, the, not the small catechism, the catechism that Luther would have been familiar with when he was growing up. Do you see what happens is in this arrangement? Is this arranged law gospel? No, it's arranged so that you know who God is, know how to pray, and then know how to follow his will. But when you arrange the catechism this way, the emphasis is on your actions, right? Do you see this? And so therefore, it was easy, and this is part of what Martin Luther discovered, is that my actions can't save me. So it's a confusion of law and gospel, and because it, it gives the impression that my actions affect my salvation. Do you see that? So Martin Luther says, no, 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 no. You need the law first. You need the law first so that you know you're a sinner. So he put the Ten Commandments first because the Ten Commandments show us our sin, right? So, in our catechism, law comes first. And then he did the Apostles' Creed, because the Apostles' Creed is gospel. It's what God has done for you, right? Okay? So, this is gospel. Now, since we have the gospel, now our life is a life of prayer back to God, right? So this is faith's response. So, so this is faith's response back to God since he's given me the gospel. Does this make sense? Okay. Now, how does the Christian live? He lives because God has given him life. Now, how did he give us life? In our baptism. 
He gives us life when he gives pronounces con in confession. Now, in your catechism, it's just called confession, right? The fifth part. And then the last part is the sacrament of the altar, okay? So this is how the catechism is arranged. It's arranged so that the emphasis is on, tells us the law, but then the emphasis is on the gospel, what God has done for us in Christ Jesus, right? And, and to see our life now as a gift for him, from him, but also a gift back for him. As Christians, we live, and this is a famous line by Martin Luther, we live as perfectly free, subject to none, okay? But I live as, as servant, subject to all, to serve all. Okay, so I serve others in Jesus' name. Did Jesus come to earth so that he could sit in a royal palace and eat really good food and sleep on a really nice bed? Is that how Jesus lived? Jesus says this, the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. I'm pointing my arms out to be like on a cross. So Jesus serves us to save us. Now we who are saved by him serve him and serve others. And we see that, for example, then in the catechism in the table of duties. But also in the catechism, the second section is how do we pray daily prayers? And we said the morning prayer to begin this class. Okay, so we're 36 after. Are there any questions? Are there any questions, okay? So the, the catechism is designed this law of gospel manner, 10 commandments, apostles' creed, Lord's prayer, baptism, confession, absolution, sacrament of the altar. These last three parts show us how God delivers the goods to us. Jesus died on the cross for us, but we need to remember how God delivers the good to us. And this is very, very important. We'll talk about this means of grace theology a little bit later on, but it's important to understand that you got to deliver things. Okay, for example, um, um, you see at the back of the classroom is Mrs. Franken. Mrs. Franken is from, um, the, is that central Illinois? Mm -hmm. She's from central Illinois near Peoria, right? Yeah. Okay, between here and Peoria this time of year, what do you see on both sides of the interstate? Two things, one of two things. You either see corn or beans, right? How much corn and beans do you see? A whole lot. Why? Because this, these, this corn and these beans go to mainly to feed animals so that we have meat to eat in the United States, right? Okay, now we've got meat. But does that meat do us any good at all if it's not brought to a grocery store for us to buy? Does it do us any good at all? No, it doesn't. So you need trucks to transport what is produced by farmers, right? Okay, so without transportation, the goods do us no good. Does that make sense? Without the means of grace, Jesus' death for us on the cross wouldn't be brought to us. That's why we cherish baptism. That's why we cherish the word. That's why we cherish how also the word is delivered to us in confession and absolution. We cherish the body and blood of Christ given to us in the supper. So we look where Jesus promises to be. Okay, so, so anyway, so I wanted to talk to you about the arrangement of the catechism. Okay, now the catechism, okay, you boys and girls, you know, excuse me, young men and young women, right? Called you boys and girls. You're not boys and girls. You're young men and young women. You're actually brothers and sisters in Christ. You're my fellow baptized. When I was in seventh and eighth grade, I looked upon the catechism as, oh, that's that book I have to memorize because I'm going to be confirmed. Why? Because I am a Lutheran. Why? because my parents are Lutheran. Oh, okay. Is that really a good attitude towards the catechism? No, no it's not, no it's not. So I didn't have a good attitude towards the catechism. 
But later on, as I grew to, to know Jesus all the more and rejoice in his promises, I started looking at the words of the catechism. Oh, should fear, love, and trust in God above all things. I said, that's genius. And you're going to talk about that next week? Genius things. What can get in the way of Jesus right now for you? Things, right? Activities, all sorts of things, right? Do I really worry that Lila or Landon or, or, gonna, or Carl or Michael or, or Alex or Robbie or any one of you are going to go start worshiping Baal? Are you guys going to worship Baal? No, that's craziness. I'm not going to worship Baal. But what I think about is, are there things in the United States of America that can come between you and Jesus? Are there things? Yes, there, there's lots of things. So Luther's catechism is genius. For example, third article of the creed. The meaning is, I believe that I cannot by my own reason or strength believe in Jesus Christ, my Lord, or come to him. But the Holy Spirit has called me by the gospel. Wow, this is genius. Thank you for explaining so clearly, Martin Luther, how the Holy Spirit brings me to faith. So when I started reading the catechism that way, I love the catechism. And I start thinking about the individual words of the catechism. And so it's kind of kind of cool. I can't I can't find it. I have to make it up for, for you guys. But um Many years ago, there was a TV program called David Letterman. Okay, maybe Mrs. Franken, remember David Letterman? Okay, I'm old. There's a TV show called David Letterman, and he'd do a top 10 list, except in he would do 10, 9. He wouldn't do top 10 like the first important, right? It's, he'd go down to the most important being number one, being the last, right? And so I made my own top 10 list of why I love the catechism. And it wasn't the obvious things because the catechism, you know, says that, that um, he has redeemed me a lost and condemned person, but just little things in the catechism, I thought, man, this really helps me know about Jesus more, right? Okay, so the catechism is designed to explain to you Jesus, okay? So that's what the catechism is designed to do. Okay, so. Okay. Um, your homework for this week is to do what? Yeah. You memorize. Memorize the books of the Old Testament. Okay. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, right? Okay. Um, uh, God's eternal love never right. dies. God's eternal love never dies. Then Joshua judges Ruth, right? Okay, the pair in the classroom, first and second Samuel, first and second Kings, first and second Chronicles, they're backwards, right? Alphabetically, right? Okay, and then you have what? Ezra, Nehemiah, Nehemiah, Esther, and then Job, Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Song of Solomon, okay, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Lamentations, Ezekiel, Daniel, right? Hosea, Joel, Amos, Obadiah, Jonah, Micah, Nahum, Micah, Nahum, Minnesota, Habakkuk, Zephaniah, Haggai, Zechariah, Malachi. Now you have little sentences. Remember it's five, and then what's the next number? Twelve, five, five, twelve. Okay, so you memorize it when, here's what I would suggest you do. Memorize first five books. Get it down cold. Memorize next twelve, okay? Put that together so now you have seventeen. Memorize five, get it cold, okay? And I want to explain something to you, okay? We know from cognitive science, you all are students. From cognitive science, there is a difference between thinking that you know something and really knowing it. How many of you have ever had the experience that you studied and you did, you studied, you thought you did pretty well, but then all of a sudden, the teacher puts that test right before you, and it's not there. Have you ever had that experience? I've had that experience. Yes, I have. The problem is, is that I really did not know it. 
because it was not in my true memory, my long-term memory. It was just my short-term memory. And when you study real quickly, you can remember short-term, but then it drops right out of your head, right? So memorize slowly. What you do is small parts at a time. You don't try to do all 39 at once, okay? So then next week, we're going to be talking about the small catechism and going into the first commandment. Um, but also, your, your memory work next week, um, well, looking ahead after the Old Testament books, will be the books of the New Testament, okay? Old Testament, New Testament, okay? Old Testament, New Testament, okay? So it's very, very important that you do it that way, okay? I don't have too much else for you. We're going to clean up a few desks here. Um, is there anything else from the class? Any suggestions? Okay. Um, sometimes we think that confirmation is boring. Okay. Okay. What is boredom? Have you ever thought what boredom is? Like, how many of you have ever been bored by something? I have, right? Boredom is when whatever's placed before you has no meaning to me. If somebody put a video in front of me about how to, um, you know, how to make porcelain china, I would be bored. Do I have any interest in hand-making porcelain china? I have no interest and no knowledge, right? I would be bored. However, if there's a reason to be interested, I am now interested in things that I used to think was boring. For example, the small catechism, because the small catechism teaches me about Jesus, and now I know why the catechism is so very important, because it's orientated at law, gospel, Ten Commandments, creed, Lord's Prayer, Baptism, Confession, Sacrament of the Altar. Okay, we got spray down the desk. God bless all of you. Thank you for tuning in. And this week, we're going to actually put the video on, online because we forgot to record last week. God bless all of you. Okay, thank you.